Welcome to the Star of Grind. So our speaker tonight is from Epic Ventures, and it's uh, he seems like a cool dude. I honestly just met him tonight, so we'll all get to know him together. But give it up to you guys for Nick of Stratus. Hey, thanks, you guys in the back. <laughs> Great, awesome. thanks for having me. Oh yeah, we're stoked. So, to kind of get things off, I guess, just give us a little background um, about your childhood. What was it like growing up in your family? Uh, are your parents entrepreneurs? Was that expected of you? We're going to go really deep here. Really <laughs> yeah. <fast. laughs> anyway, let me first thank Kyle and Startup Grind for, for letting us participate in this. And uh, it is fun to be a part of uh, the startup community here. Mm -hmm. To answer... Uh, Wait a second. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. So um, the question was, has entrepreneurship always been in the family? Yeah. So uh, I grew up in California, uh, outside the Bay Area. And we were, in my family, uh, my last name is Ephstratus, which is a Greek name. And uh, my ancestors obviously immigrated here from Greece. So they were early entrepreneurs, but they were not high-tech entrepreneurs. They were bakers. So we started out in the baking industry, made great donuts, great cakes, all that kind of stuff. And eventually then that evolved until uh, my dad went into the real estate business because they needed to, to open more stores and, and that led to a construction company. So when I started uh, in my career, I actually went into real estate. Okay. Very low tech. Cool. Okay, so, okay, so, so your parents were entrepreneurs and then, isn't that what you majored in? In college? I did. That I was your degree? I majored in entrepreneurship. But at BYU, I don't know if anyone here went to BYU, to get a degree in entrepreneurship, you had to take, I think, one extra class in entrepreneurship. So it's not, it wasn't a heavy <laughs> experience in entrepreneurship. But gotcha. you, know, you take every business class, marketing, operations, finance, and got educated in that way. And then uh, had to come up with a business plan and present that. And, you know, at that point, kind of realized. That's what I wanted to do, was start something on my own. Okay, so after graduation, did you go back to the Bay Area? I did. I went back to the Bay Area, and in terms of starting something on my own, I started in real estate again. I worked for a real estate investment company, and uh, I think it was 1995, and I was out there for about six months, and Netscape went public. And uh, the whole market started going crazy out there, and my wife was saying, we got to get involved in this. we got to figure something. We had both just graduated from BYU, so we wanted to get involved in the tech community out there. And we looked around a little bit, but then her father, who is one of his fathers that just wants everyone back in the nest, he called up and he said, I just bought a ranch in Montana. Would you guys be interested in coming back there and helping me start a guest ranch? And, you know, being a young guy, I thought, Wild West, riding horses, moving cattle, why not? <laughs> so I moved away from the delirium of tech and uh, went to Montana and helped start a guest ranch out there. And that actually fortuitously led me back to tech. Really? So how did that happen? How, did the cows turn you one day and tell you yeah, they, had, they had a great idea? Or yeah, I was chasing a cow. You know, if, I don't know if anyone knows much about cattle ranching, but when you're on a cattle drive, if you watch movies, you always think these guys are, you know, let's go do the cattle drive. And they race out there on their horses and they want to take all the cattle in. That's the exact wrong way to do it. <laughs> cowboys walk behind the cows, and there's a specific reason for that. The cows freak out when you start chasing them, and they start crapping all over the place. <laughs> so my early experience was trying to round up just one cow, trying to get it back into the, the pen, and this cow was crapping all over me, and I'm trying to chase it. Anyway, sorry for that, but I realized I didn't really want to be in, in that business for very long. Um, but as a, as a uh, guest ranch, we got that going, and one of our first guests was the president of Excite.com. Does anyone remember Excite.com? A few of you? It's amazing. That company sold for $6 billion and nobody remembers it, but <laughs> back in the day, it was Infoseek, Lycos, uh, Excite, and Yahoo, and 
and we were all competing to be the leading search engine at that time. Alta Vista was a little bit in that mix as well. Anyway, um, so Brett Bullington came out, and uh, I took him fishing. I took him on cattle drives, taught him, you know, a few things out on the range of how to how to uh, find fish and, and you know wrangle cattle, all that kind of stuff. A little bit of roping and some of that fun stuff. And uh, anyway, we had a good time. And he said, "Is this what you want to do for your whole life?" And, you know, we talked about me having a business degree, and I said, "No, I want your job." And uh, ultimately, that led to him offering me a job, and I became kind of his, I don't know, jack of all trades guy. I didn't necessarily work in tech or in marketing or in biz dev or what have you, but I went back and worked for him and got some incredible exposure to Silicon Valley and, and the people back there. That's awesome. So, did he feel kind of a mentorship role for you as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's, he's been a great mentor. and. Uh, after they sold Excite, Brett started doing angel investing, and so we started looking at deals together, and, and uh, he continued you know, for many years to make uh, introductions for me to a lot of different venture capital funds and entrepreneurs. So. That's awesome. So after Excite, what was your next step? So after Excite, uh, I, I came back. Uh, I did an MBA at BYU, and uh, again, my father-in-law, trying to pull us back to Utah because I'd gone out to Redwood City, California. Um, he launched another company here called Net Documents. Uh, they're actually just across the street over here, and it was a document management software company. So before Box.net and Dropbox and some of these other cloud content management companies, Net Documents was one of the first. And uh, we got that launched, and we raised money from Epic, which is my firm. Uh, previously, it was called Wasatch Venture Fund, and I slipped away at that time. So I said, hey, we got this thing funded. Father-in-law, this is great. Love your mentorship, and now I'm going to run over to venture capital, and I've been a venture capitalist ever since. Okay. So as a venture capitalist, you invest mainly in, in tech, or what's been your specialty? We do. We only do tech companies. Um, Sometimes we fall in love with, with other stuff and, and, you know, like Skull Candy, for example, we were in love with that company initially, thought it was really the funnest thing, but it's a marketing business, you know, it wasn't, they made great headphones, but they were all outsourced, wasn't necessarily tech, and that kind of swayed us away from that. So sometimes we make mistakes because we're so focused, we could have made a lot of money there. But uh, our, our focus is really early stage technology, primarily software companies. Okay. So, so you don't have a tech background at all? I don't. So what is it, so when you meet with entrepreneurs not having that same background as them, what, what is it that you look for? I know a lot of VCs might look for the actual technology behind the product, or is there something else that kind of makes you fall in love with them and want to invest? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole host of things. Um, having, not having a technology background was a little bit of a challenge for me early on uh, in, in terms of not having studied computer science. But uh, being at Excite, uh, being at Net Documents, and then jumping into the fray of venture capital, I started out as an associate at the firm. As investors, typically in our fund, for example, will invest in 20 companies in a fund. And um, when you've only got 20 companies to invest in, and you have three partners, that means we're each going to get five to seven companies to invest in. So part of it is trying to find the big market opportunity um, it's trying to find a company that has maybe an unfair advantage from maybe a technical perspective or, or just a positioning perspective, but really it's about the people and trying to figure out if there's fit. I mean, it's like a marriage, you know, you're going to, these companies, we'd love to flip them in three or four years and have big exits, but the reality is that in this day and age, you know, you look at an Omniture, for example, um, we looked at uh, Superstats. When I joined the firm in 1999, and we turned it down, and then we looked at my computer in I think 2001, 2002, and 2003, and then Josh figured out Omniture around I think 2004, and by that time Josh James said, "Forget you guys, you've turned me down too many times," and he had lots of interest from the Bay Area, um, and. and uh, Anyway, there's, you're not always right as a venture capitalist, but you're trying to find the right fit and uh, hopefully the right timing when you, when you get involved with these companies. Okay. 
Now, you spoke briefly about having the right team. So what in your mind is the right team? Wow, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, you know, we've done a few deals. Uh, you know, I can speak to the successes and the failures. Um, you know, I mentioned Skull Candy, for example, uh, which has been a big success here, right? So previous to Skull Candy, many of the, the early guys at Skull Candy were at a company here called Freeport. Probably many of you don't remember Freeport, but in 2000, 2001, that was a company that raised you know seven million dollars plus and had maybe 90 people at the time uh, at the, the the top of their their uh, growth. Anyway, Freeport ended up not being a good outcome for anyone, but the founders of Freeport and some of the management have gone on to be at multiple companies here that have been really successful, like Logo Works, like Skull Candy, um, and a bunch of others I can't remember now. So, you know, that one didn't work out for us, but definitely those individuals were individuals that were going to be creative, that were going to be successful at some point in their careers. Um, you know, we did a deal here. Uh, many of you, if you came to this event previously, saw Josh Coates uh, talk, and he, he did mosey.com, and now he's doing in structure. We're investors in both of those deals. And um, Josh, interestingly, um, um, when he came to us and pitched us Mosey, he had a really interesting pitch because he said, look, I'm going to back up every computer in the world. And to do that, you really need to know how to build large systems, extremely large systems for backup and syncing, etc. And he said, I'll tell you guys right now, there are 10 people in the world that could build a system that I've conceived. And he said, seven of those people are at NASA, two of them are at Google, and I'm the only other one. <laughs> so in terms of finding people, that's the unfair advantage you're looking for. And we had to go validate that, and it was hard because we didn't know any of the guys at NASA or the two guys at Google. But um, we had on our advisory board the CTO of Hewlett Packard and the CTO of Symantec, and both of those individuals in their companies had backup products. And we had them meet with Josh, and uh, Josh was a young guy and pretty brash, and he said, look, you know, this is how I intend to do this, what I'm going to build, and I'm going to put both you guys out of business. <laughs> he meant the backup business. And, uh, you know, he believed it, and he was passionate about it, and, you know, you still had to make a bet. It wasn't guaranteed, but, but it was a fun ride. Okay. So have you ever looked at a company and everything's been right but one or two people on the team and asked them to change that team? Or is... Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm not going to call out names, especially uh -huh. because we're videotaping it. <laughs> I'll see it someday. But um, no, finding the right team is essential for mm -hmm. any of you guys that want to be entrepreneurs. And you may band together as a couple guys that, hey, we got this idea and you help each other early on. And then maybe you realize that one or both of you aren't the right fit to take the company to the next level. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, don't get married to the idea that you have to be the next Josh Coates or Josh James or what have you. You know, if if you can get a company off the ground, I mean, there are just thousands of companies that are trying to get off the ground in this day and age. And you know, to to become a Dropbox or a Box.net is just the odds are so stacked against you. So. You know, find, find the right team that you can work with and figure out where you're best suited to contribute to that team. Okay. Is there any kind of a key characteristic that you will say, like a glowing moment when you know you have the right team? Something that gives um, you Yeah, when, when you get the check when you've sold the company. <laughs> that was the right team. Um, no, and again, it's not, it's not just about the ultimate outcome. We, we obviously love it when we make money for our investors, but it's really, it's got to be about the ride. And, you know, the, the best companies I've worked for, or been a part of, are companies that develop a culture and a personality, and whether it ends up being, you know, a 2x return or a 20x return, guys are having fun, you know, we're only going to live once, and, you know, a startup's going to be five to ten years of your life. So enjoy the ride, and if you get a great outcome, you know, all the better.
Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about how how do you get, go about getting funds. So as entrepreneurs, we all we all all love to be funded. So how do we score a meeting with you, or how do we make ourselves presentable enough that you want to take a look at a company that we're building? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, it's a pretty simple answer. We we love referrals, right? So we want to have uh, friends and people that we've worked with send us the, the companies. So we get plenty of over the transom, we call it kind of email uh, exchanges, but, but really what's going to get you noticed by us is if you have someone we know and respect or have worked with that, that will make an introduction. Okay. Now how about entrepreneurs who have failed multiple times? Are you willing to look at them? Is that something you shy away from? Um, you know, it obviously can be a deterrent, but I think, you know, I mentioned Josh James, he'll tell you, I think he failed the first three or four times with different business models, and now we're sitting here in Adobe, so he figured it out. Um, and we've learned our lesson over the years not to, not to write people off. Um, you know, a quick example, we invested in Linux Networks. Um, I think that company raised about 50 plus million dollars. Um, that ultimately was not a great venture kind of outcome. Uh, we invested in another uh, security software company uh, that likewise raised upwards of $30 million from other outside investors, not a great outcome. But the two, found, two founders of Fusion IO were the guys that started, were at Linux Networks and, and this other security company. So, you know, you're going to have failures. Market's not always going to come your way, but ultimately you keep pounding and, and eventually you may figure it out. It's good to know. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> why don't we talk a little bit for about, I guess, are most of your deals Utah-based nationwide? Or um, they? About a third of our deals are here in Utah, and the balance are spread throughout the western United States. We do some deals in uh, Back east, one of my partners has a home in Boston, and so we'll look at stuff in Boston and New York. But our primary focus is here. Um, early on, uh, we uh, we made a bunch of relationships out in the West with lots of Silicon Valley, uh, Bay Area venture funds, and uh, we ended up doing a lot of deals in the Bay Area and down in Southern California. Um, but as you guys are all well aware, now when you drive up and down the Wasatch Front here. It used to be that you'd drive from Salt Lake and there was just nothing going on until you got down to the Provo Aura. Now you drive up and down this corridor and you just look left and right and there's great tech companies all over the place. And we love that. We, we wish we were in more of them. Frankly, we, you know, we didn't have enough money to go put to work in, in all these companies. But um, we think there's going to be many, many more that are spawned off of successes like Adobe and others. So. Awesome. So, when you have these entrepreneurs who have these businesses, um, and they hit a they hit a wall, how do you help them overcome those obstacles? Are you very hands on at that moment, or do you kind of step back and let them figure it out for themselves and hope for the best? That's a good question. Uh, you know, we got to allocate our time appropriately, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, you have to have the debate of do I spend time with the company that's killing it and can run really fast. Or do I spend time with that company that, gosh, they've been through this iteration and that iteration and they're not quite making it? Um, so it, it always comes down to you know how much time you have and, and where it makes more sense to apply your your time and your resources. But we do, you know, we're pretty entrepreneur friendly. We try and spend as much time as we can with these companies, but we're not going to come in and take over the operation. We're not going to come in and say, okay, I'm the CEO and now you're going to fire this person. We're going to hire this person and do that. You know. Mm -hmm. but, but where we can add value, hopefully, is in making introductions to management that we think can come in and affect change, um, making introductions to customers, hopefully, that will be some of your early buyers and, and customer wins, and also strategic partners that we think will help you kind of get out of the gate. So that's really where we try and focus early on, and, and uh, you know, we, we try not to give up on our companies and hope that they won't give up on us. There's uh, just anecdotally, there's a company across the street here called Solution Reach. I don't know if you guys have heard of them, um, but uh, I think we've got well over 100 people there in the company today. 
and, and growing you know, extremely fast. Uh, they provide a, a messaging and, and patient engagement service for doctors to engage with their patients. So if any of you go to the dentist, you may get a text message from your dentist saying, hey, you've got an appointment today, and et cetera, et cetera. That's typically powered by Solution Reach. They've got over 10,000 dentists on their platform. So, um, but that was a company that started out in a different market completely, and we backed them. We had funded Ancestry.com, and one of their guys wanted to go do this, so we then backed this other, this guy in Solution Reach. And uh, for two years, he was in his basement with no money. I think we paid him a dollar a year for two years. He easily could have given up and said, I'm done. But he raised a bunch of money from us, and he was committed to it and really wanted to do well. And uh, we actually sold the company to Summit uh, Partners uh, last year, year and a half ago, and retained some ownership. But, you know, again, part of it is we don't want to give up, and again, we hope our our CEOs don't give up, and uh, you know, hopefully it, it works out like that. Okay, so you talked about having invested in him and he was still working in his basement, so do you have a cutoff point for when you're willing to invest in companies, or, or how early do you guys yeah. go? Uh, you know, uh, with both Solution Reach and with Mosey, uh, they were essentially a couple guys in an office. Um, uh, Josh Coates, when he pitched us on Mosey, it was the classic, you know, business plan on a nap. I mean, literally, he pulled out the napkin. At, I think we were at Bambara restaurant downtown, and he said, "This is what I think, you know, this can be," and uh, we were blown away. You know, and again, we didn't make the investment on the spot. You know, we did more due diligence, but yeah, we get involved early. Okay, it's good to know. It's comforting. So I guess before we open up to, to questions from the audience, I don't know if you guys have any, but I'm, I'm curious to know, when you look at a deal, um, is, there ever, is there any red flags that instantly turn you off no matter how far you are into giving, writing a check that you say, this is a no-go for us? Hmm. That's a good question. I know you guys probably have heard of Guy Kawasaki, right? <laughs> For his top ten list, you know, if they're driving a foreign car, if they have a goatee, you know, if they wear gold chains. <laughs> anyway, we don't do, we don't go by any of that. But this guy's out right here. <laughs> but um, no, I I don't know that there's anything right off. You know, we, we try to give people a chance. Okay, cool. So then, you guys have questions? Yeah, go ahead. When not when not to take VC money. When not to take VC yeah. money? Um, you know, that's that's a great question because you need to decide when you're starting a business: Am I doing this for a big, big win or for a lifestyle business? And I think that's a big question you've got to ask yourself. Um, and, and you know, when you take venture capital, all of a sudden you're turning not the entire company over to the investors, but you're typically going to have a board and that board is going to consist of one or two investors. You're going to have another outside investor, that, or, or excuse me, just outside board member, and you're going to be reporting to that board. And if that doesn't sound fun to you, <laughs> definitely don't take venture capital. Um, there's going to be a lot of pressure when you take venture capital to grow your business and ultimately to exit your business. Our funds typically are 10-year structured funds. So when, when we invest in your company, we need to get out of your company too, and that's gonna, you know, that's something you need to think about because some guys, for example, you know, property solutions across the street, right? I don't think they've ever taken institutional venture money, and who knows, Dave Bateman may run that company for the next four years and pass it on to his kids, and that's great. I applaud that in entrepreneurs if they can do that. So venture capital is a different animal in that way. Does it make sense to take debt instead of uh, giving the state? To take debt? Yeah. Um, you know, it makes more, most sense to just bootstrap your business and try and figure out how to grow it without having to take debt. Um, but if you do take debt and you open, you may want to, you know, want the, op you know, the option to raise money later, then we always advise people to do a convertible note so that you don't try and establish valuation early on. It's too hard with early stage companies to figure out oh, your company's worth two million, yours is worth five, yet neither of you have any revenue. So if you're only raising a small amount of you know, debt financing, 
do it in a convertible note, give some warrants or a discount at conversion, but you know, just be careful about taking debt. You mentioned valuation. How do you and you give examples of people that were drawing on a napkin giving, you know, their business plans? How do you describe the valuation to them? Yeah, it's it's a lot of it is a function of the market timing. You know, so if you were drawing the plan on the napkin in 97, 98, 99, you were still getting a 10 million pre. But, you know, in 2002 and three, you were lucky to get a 2 million pre, you know, at that time. So a lot of it is just knowing what's going on in the market and what investors will accept. And, uh, and also knowing how much money you're gonna need beyond that round to go raise future uh, rounds of financing, because if you, raise money and you think, oh man, I did so well, I raised my money at a 10 million pre, but you're gonna run out of that million dollars you raised and now I gotta go raise another 10. Your investors are gonna get squashed, they're gonna be mad, and the whole thing's gonna be a hairy situation. Yeah. Uh, what percentage do you typically come in at as far as like, ownership? Yeah, sweet spot in terms of equity ownership? Yeah, I mean ours varies between <coughs> between five to 25%, depending on how big a check we write and what stage your business is at, if you're pre-revenue, post-revenue. Um, if you're looking to raise rounds from the Valley, typically those guys will say they want 20%, if not more, um, so. And what's the kind of a time frame from, you know, the first time they come, someone comes and pitch to you till they have a check in hand? You know, it's been as fast as a month and it's been as long as a year. So some deals we like to watch and some deals, you know, we realize there's a lot of pressure and we gotta move faster. Yeah. So um, you, you've talked kind of a little bit about uh, how to choose VCs or when to go to a venture capital wrap. Um, what, what should you look for if you're a startup in a venture capitalist? What's the value? That's a great question. You're going to make me give my own sales pitch, huh? <laughs> 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 uh, I think when you're raising money uh, from, from a venture firm, you want to make sure that you're raising from the right group to begin with, that understands your market. There's a lot of great funds. There's a lot of great investors out there. Um, but I think if you're going to raise money for a software company, then obviously go to guys that have been in the software space. So first and foremost, find that fit. The other thing is you want to find the investor that matches up with your stage and your size, right? So if you're going to raise a couple million dollars, you want to talk to me. If you want to raise, uh, you know, $50 million, you want to talk to Oak Investment Partners, right? Now some of these guys, like an oak, for example, I don't know if they do this, but some of these guys take a multi-stage approach, and I think you've got to be careful with that, because if they're going to write a check to one investor that's 20, 25 million, and they're going to give you half a million, which investment do you think they're going to care about? Right? they got to go where they're most heavily invested. So uh, I think it makes a lot of sense to make sure that you find investors that understand your space, that write checks kind of in the size that you're looking for, and then look for that value add. I mean, Josh Coates is the first guy that will tell you the money's all green, take it wherever you can get it. The VCs don't add any value, you know. <laughs> he's joking. We have, <laughs> um, and, but really where we can add value, hopefully, uh, in this market, for example, is we can help you hire your team. You know, we can help you vet guys that you want to bring in to that team. We can help you build out advisory boards, boards of directors. We can help you, intro, you know, introduce you to customers, kind of the things I was talking about earlier. And hopefully that's the value add you get from us. And then when it comes time to really scale your business, you know, I give the Mosey example. I was on the board of Mosey. Um, when Josh wanted to go raise his uh, Series B round, we had raised two million in the Series A. And uh, we were able to call a bunch of buddies at different firms in the Bay Area and say, look, this is a hot deal. If you want to do this deal, you got to come out to Utah. We're not making a trip. And this doesn't happen every time. <laughs> but if you can pull it off, you want the Bay Area guys coming to you rather than you going up and down Sand Hill Road. And we were able to do that. And we were able to really get people excited about the deal early on. So we had, I think, four or five term sheets, you know, within a month 
And um, again, that's not always going to happen. But for guys that maybe haven't been in the, in the startup community before, that's the leverage you want from your venture partner, and someone that can get you in those doors. It's like you were asking, you know, how do you like to be introduced? Um, and so us calling on your behalf to go raise money can help a lot. Um, when you're looking at a company that's uh, you know pre or post revenue, um, you got companies like you know Domo. I'm talking about Josh James, who you know he's still keeping Domo somewhat under the radar. Yeah. You know, despite the. <laughs> I mean, they're not publicly demoing their you know their software yeah. anywhere. Um, and so, for a company that's you know trying to go that route, I mean, how do you view that pre and post kind of revenue? You're asking just how do we view pre and post revenue, or how do we view the staying under under the radar? I mean, what kind of company would you personally be interested in investing in? Like if you're looking at someone who's trying to fly under the radar and not bring in money to not get you know maybe noticed by you know a potential competitor. Oh, I think the competitors are pretty savvy in this day and age, and they they know about you the minute you hit the screen, right? I mean, everyone's on Angel List and Gust and a thousand other accelerator sites and crowdfunding sites, and so um, you, you kind of know who's playing in, in marketplace. So um, I, don't, I don't know that it, that it matters either way. Um, um, so would you? Pers I mean, would you prefer having? A company come into you already bringing in revenue? Yeah. Is that yeah, sure. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> Proofs in the pudding. We'd love to, you know, fund companies that, that have revenue and have already started down that path. It's, you know, I, I've given some examples of companies that, that we funded just off of, you know, business plans that are one page. But the guy that did Solution Reach, we invested in at Ancestry.com. He was a known quantity to us. Josh was actually uh, did a company. Josh Coates did a company in the Bay Area called Scale Eight, and at that time he had raised fifty million dollars for that company. And uh, through some connections, we asked him to be on our technical advisory board. So when he moved out to Utah, we were meeting, and we'd already known Josh. So a lot of it, you know, doesn't doesn't just happen over a lunch meeting. It's through networks and getting to know each other that we get comfortable doing that kind of investment. Awesome. Is there anything that you see right now in the Utah entrepreneurial community that you think is lacking or that you think that needs to be done better? That's a good question. Um, you know, I'm actually really impressed with the Utah entrepreneurial community. As I said, when I started here, in, you know, when we did Net Documents, we started in 1997, 98, we got it funded in 99, and at that time, you know, there weren't many venture funds here to begin with. There weren't, weren't many uh, attorneys that understood kind of venture capital and how to structure deals. And the models of success here were limited to I Omega, Evans and Sutherland, um, Ford Perfect slash Novell. There weren't a lot of companies, but but now you go up and down here, and again, there's there's great stuff happening. Um, you know, I think I talked a little bit about uh, a lot of entrepreneurs here bootstrap their companies and, and don't raise money. If, if there's one thing I'd want to change from my, you know, selfish perspective, I wish these guys would come to me earlier. They'll, they'd probably say they did, and I turned them down. But that's not true. At all. <laughs> so I, I applaud the bootstrappers, but we want to we want to be involved in more deals earlier. Yeah, sorry, second question, but um, do you have a, a preference or see a pro or a con when you um, are presented with a, an idea or a pitch from either business people that are kind of entrepreneur, you know, classic just idea people as opposed to the tech people? So in other words, some people, you know, really know all the business stuff or have kind of the MBA background, an idea person and hire out all the technical stuff. They just have an idea for a company as opposed to an inventor or somebody who is the tech person that's coming to you that doesn't know kind of the business side. Do you approach those in, in different ways? Uh, you know, what, what can I, th I think it's I think it's worked both ways. We've seen it work both ways. Um, typically, a strong business guy will marry himself up or herself up with a strong technical person, right? 
and vice versa. Um, and um, I, I don't think it, it doesn't necessarily matter to us if one is technical and the other's not, but um, um, but you need to have kind of that strong team that can come together and, and make it happen. So we, we've been pitched a bunch of by people that have ideas on a business and they seem to know the market really well, but they don't know how to build it. They don't know the technical side of it and that's not going to go anywhere. And we've seen a bunch of technical guys that have great ideas, but they're just dead. they're on a keyboard, you know, and they don't understand kind of the market dynamics. So I think the best thing you can do, whichever side of the house you're on, is marry yourself up with that weakness that you have, and, and that will solve the riddle. I think we have time for one more question. What's the best way to get into venture capitalism? Venture capital. Um, it's, uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, when I started, um, there were, I don't know, 800 firms or something. Now they're claiming there are only 100 active venture funds. I don't know what the right number is, but it is a pretty small you know, uh, number of firms that are active. Um, I got into venture because I helped start a company, uh, had spent some time in the Silicon Valley and uh, networking with people. And when I got into venture, uh, I started out by volunteering. You know, I basically said, I'll come work for you guys for free, and you can judge me based on, you know, what kind of value I have. And, uh, you know, I guess I did a good enough job I could get involved. Awesome. Let's give it up for Nick, guys.